During this session, I'm going to be explaining a number of ways where you can uh, practically calculate the specific heat capacities of both liquids and solids. So let's start off with an example here. Uh, if I'm looking at a liquid and I know how much energy I can place into the liquid and I measure the change in temperature and I know the mass, I should be able to work out the specific heat capacity. In this case, I've got to remember that power equals energy divided by time on topic two, and energy equals therefore power times time, and electrical power equals amps times volts. So what I can do is work out that the electric energy supplied is going to be the amps times the volts times the time. So that's going to be giving me a value for Q. Once I know that, and I measure the change in temperature, and know the mass, and I can work out the specific heat capacity. So let's give you an example here. So that's the sum I'm going to be using. So, uh, a 240 volt electric heating element is used to heat the water. The temperature of the water rose from 20 degrees to 50 degrees in 4 minutes and 20 seconds. During the heating process, the current flowing in the heater was measured to be 3.54 amps. Can we calculate the mass of the water? That's the question this time, the mass of the water. So the solution here, uh, first of all, the power rating means that the voltage times current is going to give me 850 watts, 850 joules per second. Over 4 minutes and 20 seconds, that's 260 seconds, that means that energy transferred in is going to be 221 times 10 to the 3 joules. Uh, if I rearrange my specific heat capacity formula for the mass, and knowing that the specific heat capacity for water is 4,200 uh, joules per kilogram per Kelvin, I put those numbers in and I work out that I had 1.75 kilograms of water in the kettle. Now, we've got to notice here that I'm assuming that all of the energy that I put into the kettle uh, went to the water and didn't heat the environment or the kettle itself. Uh, sometimes it's worth considering the fact that the object that the water is being held on, often the calorimeter, which is the device which you often use for this process, is going to receive heat energy as well. So that needs to be incorporated into the calculations. So therefore, if we work out the electrical energy input again, uh, and we're going to assume that the energy gained is just going to the liquid and the calorimeter, not to the outside environment, so hopefully it's, it's well ranked. Again, electrical energy is going to be the voltage times the current times the time. The energy gain, gained by the liquid is going to be the mass of the liquid multiplied by the specific heat capacity of the liquid times the change in temperature of the liquid. The energy gained by the calorimeter is going to be the mass of the calorimeter multiplied by the specific heat capacity of the calorimeter multiplied by the change in temperature. If we carry this through, we realize the conservation of energy that the electrical energy in is going to be equal to the thermal energy gained by the liquid and the thermal energy gained by the calorimeter. Uh, it's hoped we'll have a situation where initially the water and the calorimeter were in thermal equilibrium, so that means the change in temperature for both of these would be the same. Uh, if we know the specific heat capacity and the mass of the calorimeter, so it's a known measuring device, we will still have a situation where the only unknown is the specific heat capacity of the liquid. So therefore we can rearrange to work out what the specific heat capacity of the liquid is. But that's a, something to be aware of, that you need to think about and where else the heat energy can be transferred to. So that's liquids. Uh, a similar method can be used to calculate a solid. And often we have solids uh, which are specially prepared, like a block of metal, and what we'll have is it'll have two, uh, it'll be a cylinder and it have two holes drilled in it. One hole will be designed for the thermometer and one for the heater. We often use glycerine uh, to make sure that the thermal contact is more effective between the thermometer and the uh, metal block and we often make sure that it's very well insulated so to avoid the problem of any energy loss to the environment. In 
in that case, uh, we also make sure that the holes are in the centre so the heat spreads out evenly through the book. Uh, the thermometer, another feature here, is tries to be halfway between the heater and the outside of the book so we get the average temperature of the book. Now with all those features in place, we have a very similar situation. Here's an example question. An 850 watt heater is placed into a hole in a piece of copper of mass 1.75 kilograms. Calculate the temperature rise in the copper if the heater was left for 4 minutes and 20 seconds. And calculate the final temperature of the copper if the heater was left on for 10 minutes and the copper was originally at 65 degrees centigrade. So two questions here. Pause. Think okay, calculate them. The solutions work like this. Energy transferred to the copper is 850 times 260, which is 221 times 10 to the 3 joules. <coughs> Putting the values in that I know, and notice how I know the specific heat capacity of the copper, then I can work out that the temperature change is going to be 324 degrees centigrade. Question B, okay, this time the energy transferred um, greater because the amount of time is 10 minutes, so that's 600 seconds. So the total energy transferred is 510 times 10 to the 3. And in this case, the change in temperature is going to be 747 degrees centigrade. Now remember, in this case, we knew what the initial temperature was. So therefore, we can say that the final temperature is going to be 812 degrees centigrade. There's another way of calculating the specific heat capacity of a liquid, and this is known as the method of mixtures. What we can do here is if we have a known mass of a liquid at a known temperature, and a known mass of a known liquid at another temperature, when they mix, what happens is they will reach a, a thermal equilibrium, so they will reach uh, a, a third temperature. That means that we can work out what the change in temperature for liquid 1 is and the change in temperature for liquid 2 is. With that knowledge, we can rearrange to find any unknowns if they're present in that formula. So let me just show you an example of this. I'm going to mix 200 grams of water at 75 degrees and 500 grams at 300 degrees, uh, 300, 30 degrees centigrade. Now when I mix them together, I get 700 grams in total. Now in this situation, I know that the specific heat capacity for both of these samples is going to be 4200. The question is, what is the final temperature going to be? So in this case, change in temperature 1 is going to be 75 degrees minus an unknown temperature. And the change in temperature of beaker 2, the change in temperature for the sample 2, is going to be the final temperature minus 30 degrees. So then I'm going to rearrange, I'll give you a chance to rearrange that, work that through, and you should come out with a final temperature of 43 degrees Celsius.